Um, it's wonderful to have everybody here. This is, is going to be a great panel on forging an uh, Islamic American identity. Um, and we have with us uh, a few notable folks here in the, in the room, and I think their bios are probably written somewhere on your, uh, on your handouts. Uh, we have, um, we have Samil Mansouri is going to speak about forging our legacy as Americans. We have, we have, uh, we have Hassan Al Yaqubi speaking about modesty, veiling, and fashion. We have Nadia Hassan, who is uh, not a contributor to the to the wise uh, to the wise uh, book, but uh, is heavily involved in the campaign. And we have Amina Jandali, who's uh, going to speak about notable American Muslims. Um, I know you've heard a lot earlier about the challenges that a lot of Muslims are facing in this country, and the challenges continue to be, to be quite, quite awesome, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about people that are actually doing something about it. So I'm, uh, I'm really thrilled with this, uh, with this gathering. So I want to begin with you, Hassana. Uh, you wrote an article called Modesty, Veiling, and Fashion, um, and um, one of the most frequently asked questions is um, about Muslim women. That's constantly asked, you know, everybody's concerned about Muslim women. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how do you answer that question when they talk about veils and, and covering and how that, to some people, seems like an oppressive thing? Uh, do you have your, your lover there? Yeah, sorry. Assalamu alaikum. Um, again, my name is Hassan Ali Aqoubi. I'm pl pleased to be here. Um, I think that the main issue when it comes to uh, Muslim women and their oppression is that generally when we're hearing about their oppression, um, it's usually from forces who really don't know kind of the reality of the lives of Muslim women. So uh, the issue is we assign these collective mega narratives to all of Muslim women, right? They're all oppressed. When the reality is, is that Islam is practiced in very different ways through culture throughout the world. And so when we look at the hijab, the way that it's performed here in the United States is different than the way it's performed in the Middle East. And the particularities are very important because it allows us to understand there's not one type of Muslim woman and we can't try to find this kind of linear uh, narrative that we can ascribe to them. We have to recognize the particularities of Muslim women all around the world. That's the first thing. The second thing is this idea of choice. Uh, we, we look upon a Muslim woman, we think she must be oppressed if she's wearing that. Well, I, I, don't, I don't deny that there are some women in the world that don't possess the choice to wear the hijab, but there are a lot of women who do. And generally, those are the women that don't get covered in the media. Those are the stories that we're not hearing, because usually we don't hear from Muslim women. We hear about them, right? Um, and it's important to recognize that um, many women are making the decision to wear the hijab. But what's also important is that the reasons in which women are um, adopting the hijab are varied. My reason is different than her reason, and her reason is different than her reason, and we have to recognize that. Um, uh, and one, just one last thing I want to mention is we have to uh, feel confident in being visibly Muslim. We do not have to be ashamed in the fact that we want to, we are straddling a dual identity, that we are both American and Muslim. We don't have to be either or. We can very comfortably be both. Um, and uh, and just, just to, very quickly, I want to say, we can't allow our hijab or our, the, the, the visuality think that it's going to prevent us from getting jobs and interviews, et cetera. And I just want to say that in addition to being a PhD student, I'm also a fashion blogger, and that went from you know, um, uh, hosting annual um, events in support of female Muslim entrepreneurship to hosting the largest Muslim, uh, modest fashion convention in the US. And Instagram launched a marketing campaign where they wanted to choose one representative for each category that they have, a food, fa fashion, sports, et cetera. And out of all the people that they could have chosen for the fashion category, they chose me in my hijab, in my hijab. This was not a category of modest fashion, it was fashion. There are so many more experienced and qualified people, yet they chose me in my hijab. And so look at the opportunities when we project our confidence in ourselves. Uh, I can't help but think that economics must play into that because there's a lot of companies that have added a hijab line, right? I mean. Uh, uh, what are some of those companies and what's happening there in that arena? Absolutely. I mean, we have to say, if you want to talk about Muslim women, Muslim women are having a moment globally. 
We are experiencing a global phenomenon right now, and it's as a result, actually, of modest fashion. Muslim women are turning to fashion as a, a powerful medium in which they're communicating their very unique identities. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The world has taken note. And now you have mainstream brands, DKNY, H&M, um, Tommy Hilfiger, um, American Eagle, etc. the list goes on, that are now catering to not the Catholic or the Mormon or the Jewish women, because they also have, um, they also have religious uh, requirements when it comes to dress, but they're catering to the Muslim woman. And that's important. We can't deny that there are capitalistic gains here. Of course, they want their piece of the pie because it's a highly, highly profitable market and very underserved. But I, my, my argument is that what it's done for um, Muslim subjectivity on the grand scheme of things, the inclusivity, the visibility, you go to the, the mall now and all of a sudden on the, the, the model on the wall is wearing a headscarf, that's as a result of the modest fashion phenomenon. And so I think that it's a beautiful thing and, and, and it's a powerful medium. Well, I mean, I think I think modesty in itself requires more fabric. So I think for, for, the, for, for, the, for the companies, they see that as, a pos as an option. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so just by you know, I'm just saying, you know. Um, I want to move to you, Sami. Uh, you wrote an article called "Forging Our Legacy as Americans." Uh, it's a very, it's a very uh, difficult thing to really kind of navigate at times because it's commonly assumed that being American is inherently, uh, or, or being Muslim is inherently un-American. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Absolutely. Thank you, Andy. Um, first of all, congratulations on all those accomplishments. Incredible. I'll speak up here as the uh, Muslim non-woman. Um, <laughs> but uh, regarding American Muslim identity, uh, one of the challenges, and I recall when I was in college, I was, uh, as many were, on the executive board of the Muslim Students Group and, uh, at Rutgers University. And I remember one of the biggest challenges that we faced there was this constant pull and push between our dueling identities. Uh, very often we were told, for example, that to be part of a greater ummah, to be part of a greater global community, you needed to somehow subtract pieces of your American identity. And I always found that really troubling. Um, for those who have had uh, the opportunity to read my article, I mentioned the article very clearly that my grandfather was an engineer for Apollo 11. Uh, he was a NASA engineer. He sat a few rows behind Lyndon Johnson when the rocket took off in 1969. Um, they actually were part of the brain drain uh, that the U.S. was pulling engineers from around the world in order to essentially beat the Soviet Union getting a man to the moon. And at the time, um, you know, when they arrived, it, there was no question that they were American. When they arrived, there was this firmness that they were adopting, not only uh, keeping their faith, but also adopting their new homeland. And I feel that that has somewhat eroded over the course of the next few decades. Um, and so when I was in college, and this was told to me that to be part of the Ummah, you needed to reject certain aspects of your Americanness. I found it extremely troubling, and I think that one of the calls and pulls towards um, radicalization, extremism, whatever term we want to use for it, is really this question of you cannot be both. And I think that that is the biggest challenge of our current time with regard to our Muslim youth. So that's just, I'll touch more on it as we go. When I read that article about your father, I couldn't help but think of the film, uh, The Hidden Figures. Uh, so this is another hidden figure that, uh, in, that, in that story. Um, I know that, that um, you call yourself a proud Muslim and a proud American. Do you feel like you constantly have to, when you say I'm a proud Muslim, you have to say proud American also, just, just, uh, just for the record? <laughs> well, I think that it's interesting because, I mean, I grew up in you know, a relatively not so diverse part of New Jersey. Hopewell Township was part of the, my upbringing. And, in that area, um, it's Hopewell. I mean, it sounds white picket fence, right? It sounds fun. And uh, we were one of only, my sister and I were one of, I think, only two Muslim families in the entire school. It was so not diverse that I had moved out of that school. I was there from elementary school until freshman year of high school. I had moved out of that school, and my senior year at West Windsor Plainsboro, a different part of New Jersey, was 9-11. This school literally called me back three years later and said, we need you to come and address the student body at Hopewell because we don't have anyone else. <laughs> and I went back and I spoke to the entire school about what had happened in 9-11. Uh, point being is that time and time again, we were asked where we were from. And I had a friend, Chris, who was born in London, England. He came to the United States when he was about two years old. Uh, he was still not a British citizen, by, uh, English, American citizen by high school. Nobody had asked him where he was from, but everyone was asking me where I was from. 
And I think that that is definitely part of the challenge, that we're constantly having to identify ourselves as Americans as if it should be, or it shouldn't be a no-brainer, that we are as American as everyone else on our street. And I think that that is something that we as a community have to begin to instill in our children. This push today, in my perspective, that towards isolation, and I really do feel that it is a push. Um, and I have no, nothing against, for example, Islamic schools. But this push towards it being involved in only in the Islamic school, only in the mosque, only in one's uh, centric community, that is a push which is deeply troubling because the more that we push towards that isolation, the more that our fellow American will know less and less about us. And that breeds suspicion. Thank you, Sami. I want to move over to Amina. Uh, uh, thank you for being here as well. You talk about notable American Muslims. You unhide the figures, basically. And there's a lot of, uh, I, I was surprised by some, but, but there's, there's a lot of uh, very significant figures in American culture, in American history, in American uh, everyday life that people, sports and so on, that are, that are Muslim. Can you speak about why is that necessary? Why, why, do you, why are you talking about notable Muslims? We don't talk about like notable Christians or notable Jews. We talk about notable Muslims. Why? Right. Well, I think you'll know that a community has arrived when regular kids in a classroom can cite a Muslim the way they can cite, you know, Jewish figures or just regular, you know, Christian Americans. And going back to just the idea that, you know, being a Muslim is separate from being an American, we have to go back to our history, which we also talk about in the article that has been mentioned previously that, you know, Muslims were coming to the United States not voluntarily, <laughs> Uh, even before we became a nation. And so we have been here from the very first moment. And that continues. So from the time of slavery, you're saying. Exactly. And the you know, percentages vary from 20% to 30%, but we know it's a, a significant percentage. We know that many of these stories uh, are about really exceptional people who were literate, who were uh, very proud people, people like um, Abdurra uh, Prince Abdurrahim. There's a PBS movie about him because he was a prince in his native homeland. And so these stories have to be part of the narrative. We can't just start with the 20th or 21st century. And then that continues with the immigration um, in the late 19th century into the 20th century, people coming here for many of the same reasons that all people came here. We have to remember we are a land of immigrants, whether voluntary or involuntary. And among those are people that are sometimes uh, unknown heroes, people that we don't know about or talk about. Oops. And um, then bringing us up to really the watershed moment, and of course, with, with, again, with the going back to the African legacy here, the rediscovery of Islam through the nation of Islam and then the mainstreaming of that um, with the son of um, Elijah Muhammad, Warthi Muhammad, really bringing his community into mainstream Islam. So it was, I would say it's in stages. If we look at the history of Muslims and notable Muslims, it really was in stages. And for immigrant Muslims, uh, voluntary immigrant Muslims, I think 90, 1965 was a watershed moment because it was the opening of doors based on immigration law changes that allowed people from countries other than Europe or Western Europe to really come here. People like my father who came here to do a PhD in statistics, like my husband who came here to do a PhD in structural engineering. If you go to most Muslim gatherings, it's pretty much divided between the engineers, the doctors, and now there's a whole group of lawyers. Uh, we are And the really restaurateurs. I'm sorry? <laughs> and the restaurateurs. And the, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> right. but, we really are a model community in the sense that we are high achieving, hard working, uh, academically upward, and we are now found in many diverse fields. Well, I know when I was growing up, my guy was Muhammad Ali yes. and, and Malcolm X. Those, yes. those were like the, the guys that you always, always looked up to, but uh, were there any surprises in, in, your, in your research? Yeah, so 15, 20 years ago, you would ask- Q-tip, Ice Cube, yeah. Lupe Fiasco, You'd ask I mean, them, really. They would, they would only know Elijah, uh, um, um, Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X, that would be the end of it. But yeah, we have now, we have rappers, Lupe Fiasco, we have uh, Mos Def, we have Q-tip, we have some people who you listen to their music, and I'll admit I don't always understand what they're <laughs> saying, but my son will say, hey, mom, mom, they made Muslim references. And so even people who aren't necessarily Muslim are making Muslim references. We, we are hitting sports, of course, if the Hajj Muhammad, I call last summer the summer of the Muhammads. It was the passing away of probably the greatest American Muslim, Muhammad Ali, whose legacy was really um, incredible in reaching out to people of so many diverse backgrounds, but it was also Dalia Muhammad, Dalai uh, Muhammad uh, making gold, and then if the Hajj Muhammad first hijab-wearing member of the Olympic team winning bronze, and I think that really uh, was just 
visually such a such a, a moment for Muslim women and women in hijab, and it's kind of continued since that point. Um, and then, of course, in, in so many other diverse fields, um, in, in business people, uh, Shobani yogurt has been made famous to that, um, edible arrangements, uh, also owned and founded by a Muslim, um, and then into academics, into you know Hollywood, it, it, the list just goes on and on and on. So I think in the last two decades, we've just seen a blossoming of Muslim achievements across so many fields, so that's not just the doctors, engineers, and, and lawyers anymore. Speaking of, of, of Hollywood, how much, how much do you, is, has Hollywood moved in that direction of having likable Muslim characters, uh, for instance, like a sitcom that is based around a Muslim family or something like that? Has that, has that I, I know that there was a moment there where it seemed like there was an opening, but it, I don't know if it's been pulled back. Yeah, I mean, we have Dr. Sh Jack Shaheen's um, momentous work about Hollywood and its treatment of the Arab, and of course that's associated with the Muslim, and it, it's not good news, and it's been like that for decades. Um, there have been initiatives, just as I was flying here yesterday, I was watching um, The Big Sick, um, which is about a Pakistani-American and falling in love with a, uh, a white American and kind of the struggles there. So you are seeing those um, films now hitting the movie theater. You're seeing them on Netflix. You're seeing independent kind of efforts like Halal and the Family by Asif Mandavi. Um, so we're on the way. We, we have a lot of young students who are going into film and, and you know, getting out of that whole <laughs> physician, engineer, um, law, you know, cycle. But um, I think there's more to come, and I'm hopeful. So turning to you, uh, Nadia, I know that uh, I was reading you have some sort of relationship with Muhammad Ali. What's, what's the deal with that? Can you speak a little bit more about that? Okay, so the relationship with Muhammad Ali was not through me, it was with my family. Um, my uncle was a boxer, and my, f uh, my other uncle uh, and my father were boxing fans. And so in the rink, that's where they met Muhammad Ali. So now this predates um, before Muhammad Ali accepted Islam. So they were like the only Muslims in his, so he, he wasn't Muslim at this time. And there's a funny story because when uh, Muhammad Ali met, uh, the, you know, became, it got introduced to the nation of Islam and, and came into Islam, he came up to my uncle and he put his arm around his neck and, you know, went like this and go, I had to whoop your behind for not telling me about Islam sooner. But the reality was my uncles were not religious because, again, they were orphaned and they grew up very poor and they had to just find had a way to eat. There was eight of them, eight kids, and my grandmother moved from Lebanon, moved everybody over here. Uh, I, I would say the impact on my life, um, and I would, I would sum it up in, in one quote that Muhammad Ali had, um, where he said, he said, um, I don't have to be what you want me to be. I am free to be who I want to be. And so growing up different, I, I always felt that I was different. I wasn't the same. I wasn't, uh, when I would, even when I would go to Lebanon and visit, I, wa I wasn't Lebanese enough. You're, you're the American, you're the foreigner. So I was always the other. So it was as I got older and learned about his demeanor, his position, his principles, how, the, and, and these men were really, literally would die for their principles. That's how convicted they were. And so I would say that was the thing that impacted me the most, is that I didn't have to worry about what anybody th thought or, or what they think of me. I, I should be comfortable enough, confident enough to be who I am, irrespective of what others think. We've got about five minutes. We have about five minutes. Should we take some questions from the audience? Let's take a couple questions. Go ahead, please. Okay, hi. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Uh, we've heard so many wonderful things from this panel and the other panel, uh, and we're always asked to speak up. And I told Nadia that I would say this. How can we speak up? And I'm going to address this to the Muslim non-woman. <laughs> uh, and I think so I, I think that's that's a really good question for the entire maybe panel here to address because I think oftentimes we are expected to to say something when we get up to talk and all of you have had opportunities obviously to be in public and to speak. What do you guys hope to take away for for, for the folks that are hearing you? What do you hope that they would take away for? Maybe you can begin with you. 
Um, one of the questions that I was going to answer is that generally when you're a Muslim woman, you want to know about your experience about being visibly Muslim in the airport, et cetera, et cetera. And I was in the airplane and a five hour ride, two hours in, the man beside me says, what's that thing on your head? And I'm like, ooh. I had to swallow and gather and get my jacket. And I said, well, this is a headscarf. I, I wear it because I'm Muslim and it's a sign of modesty, just as the mother of Jesus did, to keep my morality in check. And he said, that's the most beautiful thing I ever heard. And he turned around and we didn't speak the rest of the ride. I mean, that was the extent of it. But the reality is that is likely the only conversation he'll ever have with a Muslim woman. And generally our reaction is to, that's invasive, that's personal, don't ask me that question, I'm offended, et cetera. And that's okay, that's your prerogative. But I actually think that those uh, interactions, if we kind of shift the perspective, are an opportunity, not just for that person to learn, but for you to learn about your own self. How many times do, I, do you know the answer as to why do we fast? Why do we pray? Why do we wear the headscarf? So you go home and it makes you research and be more introspective and learn more about, well, actually, why do I do that? And it helps you articulate why we do the things that we do. So look at, look at it as an opportunity that's mutually beneficial. They're going to learn and we're also, you're also going to learn about yourself. And just know, when I, I remember when I posted this on Instagram, so many of my followers said, you know, the reality is I actually want to ask those same questions, but we don't know how to ask. So be mindful of that. You know, half of my family is Christian, and my, my aunt said the same thing. She's like, I also wanted to ask, but I don't know how to ask. So just be mindful of that. I, I wanted to maybe, and, and we'll go back to you, Sammy. I want to ask the other women, do you get offended when people ask you about, about your dress? Absolutely I mean, not. Yeah. I mean, I welcome any question. I mean, I was just at a, a presentation yesterday, and I was bombarded with questions about ISIS, about terrorism, about Sharia, about all of the kind of hot button issues. And you know, if they're not going to ask a Muslim, who are they going to ask? Fox w News. But CNN? why would you want to? Why would you answer about ISIS? I mean, I I don't know that much about ISIS. Right. I don't. You know, I, why would they ask you just because by the fact you're Muslim, you should know something about yeah, ISIS? Yeah, there's an assumption that you know, just like we often look at, you know. Catholics and what happened with the priests, or we look at, you know, we, we kind of paint everyone with a broad brush unless they belong to such a large group that you can't really do that. So it's an unfortunate reality. But I think if we're going to get offended when people ask us, then where are they going to go with those we're questions? We're going to be always offended, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, there's the hostile questioner who has an agenda, and you can kind of tell the difference with that. And usually what happens is the other people in the audience will kind of shut them up. But if they're asking sincerely because that is what they see every day on television, then you have to assume that they are sincere in why, why they're asking. Yeah, I, I don't you? get offended either. I've been asked everything under the sun and under the kitchen sink. And um, I actually was speaking at a university once um, to a group of veterans who had fought in the in Iraq, and, and some of them were um, stationed in uh, Afghanistan. And they, I had given just a, a very simple presentation about Islam and rights, women's rights, and talking about justice and how important uh, uh, it is for er for er for Muslims. Uh, to not, I'm sorry, how we as human beings, it's important for us to uphold other people's rights and make sure that we maintain peace in society. And so I went through this whole presentation and the, these guys were just, they were just surprised because it was nothing what they knew about Islam. They were just like, well, what you're telling us is so foreign to us. This is not what we know about Islam, hence why we need the Wise Up report. But, uh, and he's like, well, what do you do? So one of the veterans asked me, he said, what are you doing to spread this around the world? And I said, well, the Quran is already around the world. I said, what do you want me to do? Fly to Afghanistan and wave my white flags and say, I've got the true version of Islam? I mean, it's there, you know, it's, it's there. It's just people have to read. I just want to add very quickly about the being visibly Muslim. Generally, like my sister will tell me, oh, or someone would say, you know that those people are staring at you. I'm like, well, I must look good if they are staring at me. It's, you know, if you always blame the reason why you didn't get the job or the interview or the position, et cetera, on you being Muslim, it creates highly sensitive and self-conscious people. And when you are confident, you project that confidence and people around you will feel that. And again, it's just a reminder to be confident in who you are. I feel it. I feel it. Um, if, 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 if we can go maybe, maybe to Sammy. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, the takeaway. If you can get the microphone, please. And then I also want to, I know you had a question for me, and I'd like to hear it. So just, uh, but I, I just wanted to, I mean, echo everything that was said about confidence and, and identity. Um, but one thing that if I had to say, speak on my portion of, of the panel, um, 
I, I think it's crucial at this, at this stage. We're, we're at a turning point where we have to, you know, it's said a lot that we have sometimes one foot in the door and one foot out of the door. And I think that is probably one of the most frustrating things for me personally, where I see individuals, for example, who continue to raise their children, continue to push this narrative that they are an other, that they are from somewhere else. Um, and that's fine. Uh, it's okay to be proud. I have Egyptian heritage. I'm very proud of that. It's an ancient civilization that you know there's, has almost no match. Wonderful. But I'm American. And if that is not said and if that is not repeated to our children, um, if JFK only has one destination or two destinations, Cairo and Karachi, um, then we're going to continue to have issues. We're going to continue to be uh, treated as an other as long as we treat ourselves as an other. So American history is our history. It should be taught in every school. I was, I was disappointed when I looked at the curriculum of some Islamic schools, for example, and the American history is brushed over and it's, it's rushed through and Pledge of Allegiance isn't even said. Um, this frustrates me, and I think that's something that we have to change, and if it's not going to happen in an American-born generation, then I don't know at what point it will. So that is my personal takeaway, um, and then when we get the chance, I really do want to hear your question. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, actually, um, if we have to close this panel in two minutes, so I'm going to allow every um, questioner 20 seconds. Okay, this is really an easy one. How can we empower people to speak up? And since we are American citizens, can we speak up against prejudice against any religion by our simple vote? And I'm speaking to everybody. Do you want to take the other question? That sounded really rhetorical, but that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 yes. I got it. Ah, thank you. I'm Jamila Malik, and I'm um, originally from Jamaica, Queens, New York. I grew up at Masjid Malcolm Shabazz, and my question is, how did Linda Salsa get on the cover of Essence magazine? Okay. All right. Um, was that, was that you, were, you were concerned about that? Is that a question? Okay. Yes, hi. My name is Dr. Maha Hilal, and... I have to say, as a Muslim, I, I have a very different perspective than what's been presented here. So my question is specifically, it seems like a lot of the onus and burden of Islamophobia, the way that I've heard it today, seems to be on the Muslims. So you talked about Muslims um, siloing themselves, marginalizing themselves, or like the solution to Islamophobia is to be confident. Or, you know, we're, we always have to explain things about ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda, whatever, as if we should embrace collective responsibility. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on that because I think, to me, it's a very problematic um, set of assumptions. And the last question from Sister Hanifa, please. I wrote it to be quick. Okay, as one whose uh, ancestral, ancestral heritage is both Native American and African descent and whose historical narrative is inundated with oppression, is there a way for us to be able to define a strategy by which our hijab is not considered oppression based on the history of what if oppression truly was in this country. Thank you so much. Right. Really, really quick, I'll just, I'm gonna be through them and I'm gonna just toss it over to the ladies really quick, really quick. Regarding the point about the voting, yes, and shame on anyone who still thinks that voting is haram or questionable, shame on them. Um, this is the next thing regarding the confidence versus collective responsibility. Uh, truth be told, with regard to collective responsibility, no, we're not responsible for anything that anyone else has done. We are individuals. We are not responsible for someone who is a co-religionist who acts in an insane way. However, we can be ambassadors of truth, and that's something I think which is a gift or a burden, perhaps, that is placed upon us. Um, for those of us who are sane, who are living as good citizens, who are trying to do the right thing each day of our lives, um, I don't think that we have to, but it's something good to do, to speak up when we see wrong. Um, and that's also what our faith teaches, and it's also what uh, the average American needs from us, because many of them, they just don't understand, and we need to help them understand what the truth is. Okay. So, just quickly to the point about not allowing them to define us, I absolutely agree. So if you're getting up there and giving a presentation, you absolutely would not start by talking about, I'm not ISIS, and I don't agree with ISIS. You talk about who you are. You are a God-fearing person. You are a good uh, member of society. You're... you're Religion teaches you to help the poor, to stand up for the oppressed, to be good to your parents. All of these are common American values. In the event, at the end of this beautiful presentation, which inevitably will happen because people are coming to hear about a religion which all they've heard is what they see on the television screen if they're gonna ask those questions, and they are often embarrassed to ask them. 
um, I think we need to rise to that occasion. And it's a good way to kind of, one of the things that I say a lot is that when, when and I think it was referred to in the previous panel, whenever a, an act of violence takes place, Muslims will sit and wait to see how the media uh, talks about it. If they use the word terrorist, we know right away it's a Muslim. If they call it a lone wolf or a uh, mental Ill case, we know that it's not. And they can immediately get that. So sometimes you answer a question in a way that is not direct, but which they can relate to. When you're talking about jihad, for instance, talking about the Revolutionary War against you know, oppressive taxes, the uh, aggression in World War II, which, you know, we stood up for our allies. You need to be able to enter their mind so that they can relate to you. And I think that's where, as Muslims, we can do a better job. It takes a little bit of training and experience, um, but I just want to add that. So before um, I make my concluding remarks, I want to make an announcement that we are not taking a break uh, between this session and the next session because it's a very short session before we break for lunch. So I'd, want to, I'd like to invite uh, Brother Wajahat Ali to make his way to the stage because we're going to get started right after I say these last words. Um, to answer the question of Andra who asked about what can we do, people are already doing things. Daisy Khan with the Wise Up Report, this summit. This is, this is huge. It's going to have a huge impact, not only today on all of us, but it's going to have a huge impact on our youth. And I am a person who have dedicated my life to working with youth. I have founded the Young Leaders Institute, which is an organization that trains young people, uh, training them on working on building leadership skills, interpersonal skills. Um, conflict resolution skills, ethical leadership skills. So there's a lot of us here that are doing things that are helping um, to counter the narrative. And like we said, it's knowledge that's going to end extremism. Thank you so much for Thank each you. of you. Thank you so much. Thank you.